I guess how I'm feeling that I want this message to speak to me, and you're like, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, because <laughs> well, now my prayer is always that God is speaking, not me. And in that, I hope that as I say any word, that it speaks as much to me as it does to anybody else. So that's what I mean by that. That I not say anything and it not have that revelation and conviction in me. Um, but I, I, I want to just ask you to, to, if you will, continue on in that mode of worship, in that mode of our hearts just laid open before Him as we continue on in this. Like there's not a transition, you know? We're not just going through the steps of how you do church. Because I feel like to me, and God's in different ways dealing with me in this, in the in these words. Um, and I just want us to keep in that moment of not, well, I want to hear a good word, although hopefully it's good, you know, because it's going to be God, hopefully. <clears throat> but that we want to hear the conviction, the the unbelievably loud voice of God. Right? I, because too many times we get into motions of, of things. Like, I can drive to certain places, like my house, to work, to you know, the same way. And sometimes it's like, I don't even know if I thought about how I did that. I don't even remember doing it, you know? You, get, you, you can get into a mode of just doing things. And you've done them so much that you don't have to think about it, and it doesn't mean anything to you. And coming before God should never, ever be that way. But it gets that way sometimes. If we don't check ourselves in, like I'm saying, like that's what, I, for me too, I'm I like, God, don't ever let me come hear a word from you. Go to a service, like listen to a song, a worship song, a message or, or whatever, anything, and it not be your voice booming in my ears, in my heart. I, it doesn't matter who's saying it. It doesn't matter if, if it's some well-known speaker or if it's just the person that I came across. If it's your voice, God, let it be your voice that I hear, not a person. Let me hear your conviction your judgment, your mercy, your grace, all that you are. Let me feel that and not be trying to just understand things with my mind. <clears throat> it's... New school, 
to think that the Word of God is written to make us feel good. To feel right or like we're doing the right thing. If you don't know what I mean, nowadays people feel like the Bible can just be read in a way that affirms everything that they believe. It's a little old school to have the understanding that the Bible is not meant to make me feel good, but actually to cut me, to confront me, to charge me with unjust things. See, the Word of God doesn't justify us, our decisions, what we do. It confronts us and calls us to account, but it then leads us to the place of justification because of Christ. See, that's where we get mess, messed up and, and mixed up. It's like, oh, this, you know, it says God loves me and, 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 and that I'm, I'm justified and I'm made right with him and it's going to make me feel good and all this stuff when I read the Bible. It's just, oh, it's make me feel good. No, that's not what it's meant to do. It's me- meant to make us understand who we are so that we know that we need him. In Colossians 3, starting in verse 1, it says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on this earth. For you died and your life is hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. This is if you've come to know him as your Lord and Savior already. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So we have in the scripture, it's like, woo! Set your mind on things above which are the things of God, because you've come to know Christ. But I love that it it slices in there to confront. And and you say, well, well, it's it's great, you know, yeah, I did that. No. Like, I'm going to preach it myself right now. I know that there are things that I still need work on, that God still needs to do in me, that he needs to cut and mess up so that he can put back together. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. So we have to understand. I'm, I'm going to speak to every, everybody no matter what place you're in, but I want to call to account those that are walking with God and, and say, I, I want to be in that place. I mean, it says... Because of the wrath of God, because the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. I want the Bible to confront me and, and to be able to speak over me to say, when you, because you once walked in these things, 
That means they don't happen in my life anymore. That means I don't deal with those things. And it's not like you, you get to a place where you don't deal with temptation or anything. You have to constantly be seeking after God and walking away from that stuff. You don't get to a place where, yeah, I can walk into any place and it doesn't matter. I don't care. It's not like, no. That stuff's going to be there. And if you're not completely faced to God and seeking after Him, you're going to seek after that. You don't get past it. You just keep walking to God. But I want this scripture to confront me and to say, because you once walked in those things. I want, because I don't want to read this like I do sometimes and say, oh, shoot. He's speaking over me saying, I once walked in those things, but, but I still am. But I'm still dealing with jealousy or strife or unforgiveness. I'm still dealing with this or that, all these different things. I don't want, see, this is that feel-good Bible. Now, don't get me wrong, it does, it does bring us to a place of joy, but that's because we found Him, not because we found ourselves. Too many times we're trying to find who we are in the Bible, instead of trying to find who God is in the Bible. This isn't that kind of Bible. It's not to find me. It's to find Him. But in order to, to come to this place, we have to, to dwell in this place with Him. Colossians 3.16, it says, let the Word, just a little bit further down from there, is speaking all these things. Actually, you know what? I didn't read that whole scripture. I'm going to go ahead. Let's go back to Colossians 3. Uh, verse 9. If you can find that. Do not lie to one another. I mean, he's speaking, he's saying, because you once walked in these things. And then he goes on to reiterate the things that we should not be doing. Because you once walked in these things, I'm going to tell you the things that you're still doing, that you're still walking in, that you need to work on. Don't lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created you. Have you put on the new man? You're like, oh yeah, there's the new man. Really? Because I see the old man a lot. You know? Like, again, I'm still talking to me, myself, okay? Um, <laughs> so you don't. I'm just going to convict myself, and you can be a part of it if you want to. But when we come to know him, we put on the new man, which is Christ. It's him. Right? How glorious that when God looks at me, that he can see Christ and not me. Because I'm a mess. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Like, let, let the word of Christ dwell. You know that word dwell. It's not like go hang out for a little bit. Let the word of God hang out with you for a few minutes. While you pray, before you leave for work, and then just do whatever you want. Act however you want. It doesn't matter. Because you prayed before you left, you know? 
I'm not talking to you guys. I'm talking to those other people, you know. But it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you. That word dwell means to abide, to stay, to be there. It's, it's just where you are. You don't leave when you dwell somewhere. That's the place you want to find me. That's where I am. You want to find the word of God. It's here dwelling inside of me. I didn't leave it at home. I didn't leave it on the shelf. But it is dwelling inside of me. Let it dwell in you rich. I love that it's, it's like these, I'm not an English major, it's an adjective, right? Richly, like, it's like expanding it. Come on, teachers. I was really bad at English, okay? And grammar. <clears throat> But it says richly, let it dwell, not only dwell in you, but richly, that it, there's an abundance of the Word of God, that there's so much. When somebody, you know, we, we like to think of like people that are rich and people are, what, what does it mean? It means they have more than enough. I don't feel like I'm rich because I don't have more than enough, or I don't feel like I have enough. And the Scripture says, let it dwell in you, but not just to dwell there, to just have a couple of cents, you know? I got a couple of dollars of the Word of God in my life. But it's here, and it is richly here. It is in abundance. It's overflowing. I've actually got enough Word in me that I could give you some, and I still got enough to give more people around me. It is flowing out of me. I just actually can't hold on to the, the Word of God that I have. i got to give it away. It's just coming out. Right? Anybody watch DuckTales when they were younger? I used to, it's like a, probably a certain age range, but you know, and then the, the uncle, what's his name? Scrooge? McDuck? You know, and it was a stingy guy that had lots and lots of money in this cartoon, right? But he had this big, like, silo or something full of gold coins. And they would go jump into it and swim around in it, you know? And that's the picture that just kind of came into my mind when it says, like, let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Like, I want the Word of God to be like a pool of the Word of God, that I jump in and I dive and I'm swimming through it, and it's just letting it wash over me. And it's just, it's just all around. It's not put in this place, but I'm swimming in the Word of God. It's just there. Let it dwell. <laughs> and you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I love it because it says admonishing. When, when we allow the Word of God to, to dwell in us richly, then it causes us to admonish, to call out things in people to speak over them to speak over their lives right it says in wisdom teaching and admonishing one another speaking life psalms and hymns singing over them the word of god that his word dwells in us so much that you can't help but sing it, but say it, but claim it, and proclaim it. That it's just coming out. <clears throat> See, 
you know, one of the, the things that I, like I've been thinking about is, is that, I see, I can present a challenge or a statement or a word to you, you know, and I was, I was thinking about this, we actually went to a conference this week, and when you hear a word of God, you hear something said, and it's like, wow, that's so good. And something can be spoken to you or over you. But the real work, the real thing happens when you go home and are alone. That's when the real war happens. That's when the real growing and learning happen. See, too many times, I've seen it too many times, and even in myself, where we try to go get something from somebody, wanting them to hold and handle the burden and fix it or take it off or do whatever, pray it off of me, pray it away, pray, do whatever, you know, pray over me. And we need that, right? And we're supposed to do that. Speaking, like I just read, speaking those things, admonishing people. We're supposed to do that. But the real thing happens when we go home and are spending time with just us and God. Nobody else can do it for us. When I hear a word... I can hear it be like, oh my gosh, that's so good. It's going to do something in my life. I love that. That spoke to me. And when I walk away, if I don't actually work those things out in my life, if I don't go home and maul them over and chew them up, right? My dad's old thing, you know, like cud, a cow. Chew it up, swallow it, regurgitate it, chew it up swallow it. These cows have like eight stomachs or something, I don't know, and they just go from one to the other, just processing. I mean, the point is a good point, though. The cow's like, I'm going to eat this grass, and I'm not just going to get a few things out of it. I'm actually going to get every bit of what is needed in my body out of this grass because I'm going to chew it up and then Spit it up again and chew it up again until I get more nutrients out of it. And then I'm going to spit it up again until I chew it up. No, you know, do whatever I do until I get more nutrients out of it. And I'm going to chew that thing up so much that there's nothing left in it. It's all going to be processed and used. It's all going to be worked out in me. Because I have chewed that thing up beyond belief. But we tend to want somebody else to carry the weight to Christ so we can walk, walk away without a scratch, you know? Right? Because remember I said, See, and that's the thing. Like, I, I, I've gone through this too. It's like, I need somebody to help me because I'm afraid. I'm afraid to take this to God on my own. What's going to happen? And somebody can help take that burden, but the real work that needs to happen is not going to happen because you didn't come to God in that moment yourself. See, it's a new way of thinking to think you know, because everything's viral, everything's, you know, online, everything's posted for everybody to see, that what's done in public is the most important thing. It's so important because it went viral, you know? 
Like, look at this, you know, my cat fell off a, there's a video of my cat falling off the shelf and four million people saw it. It's so cool. It's so, now I'm important, you know. Everybody wants to go viral. Everyone wants to be seen. Everybody wants our stuff to be known. And I think that's, that's an attack of the enemy because he knows that the most important things are the things that are done in private. The things that harm us the most are done in private and the things that help us the most are done in private. What are we choosing in that moment, right? Because we can show everybody whatever we want. People can see how cool I look and all these great things that I'm doing online. When I go home, I'm a mess, I'm tore up, and I'm dealing with anger and frustration and anxiety and all these different things, but everybody thinks that I look great and have a great life. Matthew 6, we're going to go to Matthew 6, 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. It feels so rewarding for people to see the things that we do, you know? Like the world has made it so rewarding to be seen. Verse 2, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. See, and that's the thing. And he's saying, sounding the trumpets, don't do like they do, sounding the trumpets, the hypocrites. You know? Look at me, I gave somebody 10 bucks. You know, look at me, look what I'm doing. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And I'm not saying like all, like people knowing what you're doing is horrible. But is that how we are getting our fulfillment and our praise? Who's giving us the praise? Is it the people or is it God? Right, because that's what this says. It says, uh, where is it? Therefore, when you do a terrible deed, do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. They got it. That's all they're going to get. They think it feels good for a minute, but that reward is not going to last. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Now, it's not like, you know, we can get weird about this and be like, nobody can see that I'm helping this person. Nobody can see that I'm, you know, it's not, it's not that. I mean, really the point is, and what it says is like the hypocrites, it, it means the one who's putting on, who's, who's playing and, and, and acting like they're charitable, that's acting like they're doing all this stuff, but really their life doesn't actually show that in reality, you know? So it's not saying that somebody can't see you give somebody money. What it's saying is don't be doing it to be seen, because usually when you're doing that, it means that the rest of your life is stingy as all get out, and you are just living for yourself. Oh, 
but just do it to be seen by God. Whether somebody sees you or not, it doesn't matter. But who are you wanting to see you? Who are you doing it for? And what is the purpose of what you're doing? It's to build yourself up, right? Because that's, I mean, that's, the, that's the choice here. It's either to build yourself, because that's what they were doing. You know? I'm here. I've prayed four hours today. Did you hear me? Do I need to blow the trumpet again and tell you that I prayed for you? know, do, do I need to blow the trumpet again so you can see whenever I'm giving this person money? Do I need to blow the trumpet again so you can see this good thing that I did? Or are you doing it for him, for God? See, and that's the twisted, just crazy messed up thing about how the enemy just screws everything up, right? Because People do things for people to see because they want to be rewarded openly. But this scripture right here says you can get rewarded openly and it be a lasting reward. I don't know what it means, you know, how God will reward you. But it says if you're doing it for him, if you're doing it not to be seen, But if you're doing it for God and because he's asked you to, not to be showy, but but to be who God's called you to be, and you just do it, then he'll reward you openly with reward that will actually last. Right? Because his rewards don't go bad. You know, and that's the thing. Those viral videos... Those people, they call it 15 minutes of fame because it literally lasts that long. I mean, you can shoot so high so fast and think you are living, you know, on the top of the world. Not realizing that you're going to come down that fast too and hit rock bottom. but the reward that he gives. It will be openly. It will be seen by people. It'll be a reward of seeing who God is in you and that he has blessed you and you haven't blessed yourself, you know? That's what it is. We're trying to bless ourselves. Trying to make ourselves rich instead of making God rich. You know, that's a weird way to say it. But like, you know what I'm saying? Blessing him richly instead of, instead of wanting just to bless ourselves richly. Glorifying him instead of trying to get the glory ourselves. but we got to be able to come broken before him. And there's a couple of things about this that I, that I love. One is, is that too many, so many times we think, oh, well, I'm, I'm so broken. I'm so broken. What can God do with me? And then other other. People or times or whatever we may think, I don't, I don't want to be broken. I'm feeling okay right now. But no matter what scenario we're in, that's the path that we need to go on. In Hosea 6.1, it says, Come and let us return to the Lord, for He has torn. Man, He has torn but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up.
We don't, we don't want to be broken. We don't want to get messed up in order to get healed. But sometimes that's what needs to happen, right? If a bone is a mess in growing the wrong way, sometimes they have to break it in order to make it straight. It doesn't feel good for them to like set a bone. It's painful. It hurts. But in the long run, you want your arm to look like it's supposed to look. And in the long run, you want it to work like it's supposed to work. You want it to be how it was created to be. So you will go through that pain in order to get it worked on. But we don't want to do that with God. That's what this scripture is saying. He he will tear us up. And that's what I was saying earlier. Are we willing to be torn? That he could just tear our heart open and rip us up. It's not in a bad way. It's in a good way. So that he can put us together to be stronger, to heal better, to be in a place that he has formed us for. That he would break us for the purpose of binding us to be stronger. You know, in bones, like where they heal, they're actually stronger. Stronger than it was before. And I know it doesn't, it sounds like a, <laughs> sounds kind of funny, but like, man, would we go through the pain? of being broken over and over and over in order to be stronger and stronger and stronger. Say, but I I wanted to come to this place with God that then everything was just going to be great and my life was going to be just like floating on a cloud, you know? Sometimes that's what we think. But God says, will you come into this place with me in this secret place, in this this place that I can come and... and (laughs) and operate on you. It will hurt. It'll sting. I'll probably have to pull some stuff out that's not supposed to be there. You got some infection. And it's going to spread, and it's going to cause bad things to happen in you if I don't get it out, and I need to work on that, and I need to operate and get that nasty stuff out of you But the good thing is, it's going to make you stronger. Second Timothy three sixteen it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction and righteousness. I love it. 2 Timothy 3.16 doesn't say, all Scripture is given to make you feel good. All Scripture is given to tell you that you're doing it the right way and you don't need to get worked on and God doesn't need to do anything in you and you can pull this verse out and this verse out and put them together and maybe it means what you think it means. I, you know, and, and you don't have to read the rest of the Bible. No, it says all Scripture is given as inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and instruction. Reproof and correction. I want to be corrected, right? Nobody wants to be corrected. In theory, like you're like, I, I don't really love to be corrected, but do you want to be put in the correct place? Do you want to be doing the correct thing? In order for that to be the case, I'm going to have to get corrected. The reproof 
is going to need to come so that I can show proof of being who I'm supposed to be. Would you, would you stand with me? I, I, I want to... I just, want to, I just want to live how God has called us to live. I just want to move how God has called us to move. I want the church, not life church. See, when I say the church, I'm saying me, I'm saying you, I'm saying all of us. I'm saying the people that God has called to be the church. I want the church to change culture. I want the church, I want God's people to rise up. And it just feels like, oh, everybody's a bunch of sissies. <laughs> including me. too easy here to follow God, right? So much so, we want to make it all about us. We want to make it a feel good, you know, scripture about how I can do whatever I want. How God loves me no matter what. He does. That doesn't mean he's not going to break you. You didn't read the rest of the Bible. I, I just want to see all of us. See, too many times we say, well, I, I want the Bible to make me feel good and I want somebody else to do the work. That's what if I, it feels like half of Christianity is right now. I don't know. That's, I just threw out half, but just a lot, right? I want the Bible to make me feel good, and I want other people to do stuff to make the world better. But what this word was written for is to bring each and every one of us to the place of doing the work of the gospel. To bring each and every one of us to a place where I see every single person doing something that is crazy huge, that is changing the world. You know, we have one of our missionaries, Dan, here. Sorry to call you out, Dan. But it's a good thing. Because, like, I, I <laughs> say, oh, man, Dan has been doing such a great thing. He's been ministering for 30, 29 years in South America and Panama and Costa Rica in prisons with homeless people and feeding and doing all this, this amazing stuff. You know who he was? He was you. So we see something like that and we say, oh, wow, man, to be able to do that, you can. That's who Dan is. He's you. That, that's who... Jack and Sherry Harris are. That's who all the amazing missionaries all over the world are. They're, they're you. Sorry, but there's nothing special about him. But there is because he followed what God was calling him to do.
You're an electrician, right? He's an electrician. Doing what he learned to do until he started doing what God called him to do. 